Hey guys, thanks for joining us on Family Life Today here on YouTube. YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. You don't want to miss any episodes, so hit the little bell and you'll get notifications and you won't miss anything. And if this encourages you, like it and, and share, share it with it. your friends. Yeah, share it with your friends. Yeah, welcome to Family Life Today. You know, let's not assume that everybody needs the same from us. You know, look around. Who seems a bit distracted this week? Or who do you know that might be caring for an elderly parent or a special needs child? Or who's gone through a difficult life situation? And what will be most helpful to them? What will most communicate God's love? Welcome to Family Life Today, where we want to help you pursue the relationships that matter most. I'm Ann Wilson. And I'm Dave Wilson, and you can find us at FamilyLifeToday.com or on our Family Life app. This is Family Life Today. People that have visited our house for dinner or afternoon or you name it, even just if it's an hour, when they get to the front door and we're saying goodbye, mm -hmm. they always say the same thing. What do they say? Always. I mean, it's all like, it's not 99 out of 100. It's 100% of the time. They say Dave Wilson has the best football stories ever. No, that is not what they say. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what they say. They usually, I, I, I said 100%, so I can't say anything's 100%. But almost every time they say, we just had the greatest time with you guys. We don't know why, but it was just great. Thank you, blah, blah, blah. And they leave. And I know why. Come on. You don't want to say it. because. Well, I've heard you say this before. You think it's because we've asked them questions the whole evening. No, not we. You. <laughs> you ask questions. You uh, you just invite them I to conversation. I love hearing people's stories. I love to hear what they've done, what they've been through, how God has worked, or maybe their frustration with God. I'm fascinated by those stories. Yeah, and I want to say to them at the front door, I can tell you why you you love tonight, because you talked about yourself the whole night. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody wants to talk about themselves. I mean, I always chuckle because I'm like, the whole time you were here, it was about them, which is what you've designed it to be. You're just great at oh, this. Oh, you're so nice. I don't feel like I am that good at oh, it. Oh, you are good at it. Hmm. I'm sitting there like, okay, is it time for them to leave now? And <laughs> oh, Anne is just continuing to have this conversation. I bet all of the people that have been at our house are super excited <laughs> to hear that comment. Well, you know, there might be a good game on. But anyway, we're talking about this because we are talking about hospitality today with Carolyn Lacey, who wrote a book on this and already had a great conversation. Carolyn, welcome back to Family Life Today. Thanks. It's great to talk to you again. And I love the title of your book, Extraordinary Hospitality for Ordinary People. That ordinary people, that pulls us in for sure. Yeah, because that's who we are and how, you know, most of us are. And we have a tendency, we've already talked about this a little bit, to think people that are really good at hospitality have a gift that we don't have. That's not true at all, is it? It's really something every single person can do. Am I right? Yeah, definitely. And interestingly, the commands in the Bible to practice hospitality or to offer hospitality without grumbling, they're not given to mm. pastors or, you know, church leaders. They're for all of us. And I don't think you have to have a special gifting. You don't have to look a certain way, do things a certain way. We've all received God's welcome. And so we can all show his welcome to others. When you say the heart of God is a heart of hospitality, what do you mean by that? God loves to welcome people into relationship with him. He delights in it. He doesn't hold back. He's not half-hearted and grudging. It's not like, oh, look at these people messing up life. I better go and try and do something. But he delights in drawing people into relationship with him and his heart is for people. Mm, I think that's so good. It reminds me, when I was young in my faith, I used to come before God if I if I hadn't been with Him reading the Bible or just praying in a day or two when I was young in my faith. I used to think He was so disappointed in me that I hadn't been there more often. And the older I get, the more I've understood His love for me. And all I feel when I come before Him is, I'm so delighted. I'm so excited to be with you today. 
And that mm-hmm. self-condemnation, I don't think that was from God because He's mm-hmm. always delighting in being with us. And as we experience that, that's helped me to delight in other people and being in their presence. Yeah. Have you experienced that, Carolyn? Yeah, definitely. The more I reflect on on the way God delights in me, it inspires isn't a strong enough word, really. The gratitude mm. just overflows, yeah. doesn't it? You you delight in in showing that same welcome to others. Mm. When you were sharing that, I was thinking about the story of the prodigal son, you know, and the father runs to him yeah. to put his arms around him. And and that's how God welcomes us. And, you know, even as you think about that picture, it makes you want to run to someone to do the same for them. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting. You quote First Peter 4, which I as a pastor have taught on before, which says practice hospitality without complaining. Yeah. And I got to be honest, there's been times where I've practiced it and complained. <laughs> You know, afterwards, or even sometimes it would be like Anne is trying to get the house perfect, That's which true. means I've got to do a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And I'm the guy walking around like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. But we sort of have this idea that we want our house and everything, the meal, just to be pristine. Is that what we're going for? Or should we sort of lay some of that away and say, it doesn't have to be perfect? you can do it in an ordinary way and you can actually do it without complaining. Well, I mean, that's what makes it so burdensome, isn't it? You know, the thought of, you know, all the work beforehand, getting ready, and then all the work afterwards, (laughs) recovering and clearing up. That's what makes that kind of hospitality feel really overwhelming and exhausting and and as though it's a big burden. And if we could, could relieve ourselves the pressure of that, I think that would help with the with the not complaining. I mean, it strikes me that what Peter's saying there is don't just do hospitality, but be the kind of people who love to do it. Mm. You know, don't have an don't have an inner grumble because, you know, some of us, myself included, can be quite good at at doing it nicely, but inside thinking, oh, really? Are they still here? You know, there's an inner complaining. But I think, yeah, getting rid of some of that pressure that it's got to look perfect, that I've got to clear up. Really, what we want to do is welcome people into our lives and our lives aren't pristine. Mm. They're complicated and they're messy. And, you know, there are jobs in the house that need doing because that's real life. And if we want to invite people into our real life, they need to see that. And we're on a tight budget, so food isn't always fancy. And if we're inviting people into real life, they need to see that. So it's kind of a fake hospitality, isn't it? It's a, it's a very superficial hospitality if it's all about the surface, what looks good, what's impressive, rather than this is what my life's normally like and I'm just glad for you to come and share it with me a little bit. I remember hearing a story of a young woman who was invited to a house where they were believers and she wasn't. And she was super skeptical, you know, like, oh, they're going to share the gospel. This is all about them wanting me to give my life to Jesus. And so she had this idea of what her time would be. And she said, yes, I'm going to come. And so she's dreading every minute of it coming into the front door. I remember her saying, I walked in the front door. The house is a wreck. There's laundry that needs to be folded. There's a laundry basket that's sitting there. The kids were all young and they're running around the house. And she said, it was nothing like I thought. I thought she would have everything perfect. And then the woman who invited her said, hey, can you watch the kids for a second? I need to do this. And so they're kind of doing dinner together. You know, she didn't have anything made. She goes, could you help me make dinner? And I don't know what we're having. And so she said, I was brought into this family. I thought it was going to be so awkward as I sat and they asked me questions. She said, I was brought into their mess, into their realness, Mm -hmm. into their home. And and it's so funny. And she said, and then they prayed and she said, they sang a hymn. She goes, I don't even know what was happening. But all I remember is thinking, I want this. I want to come back to this messy, beautiful, real family. And this Jesus that they just portrayed, because they, their life looks messy like mine. And yet they allowed me to see that. And they allowed me to be in their prayer. She said it was one of the most intimate things I experienced. And she started coming back week after week. They would just invite her and some other people. And she ended up giving her life to Christ. And the main reason is she saw Jesus in them. 
but they let her into their world, the messiness of it. You know, that story is a non-believer who had different beliefs about sexuality and different things coming into a Christian's home. You comment about that as you write about this. How do we uh, approach that kind of thing? You know, different beliefs, different people coming into our home in terms of hospitality. I think we just do what Jesus did. I mean, the story in John 4 of Jesus approaching the woman at the well and striking up a conversation with her is our model. She wasn't living a particularly clean life. We don't know all the details, but um, certainly there's suspicion around her. And Jesus didn't hold her at arm's length. And I don't think he asks us to do that too. Mm. And I think I think a good thing is to remember is the goal is not to get somebody converted on the first right. night. Right. You know, otherwise we're not going to have them back. <laughs> the goal is to just start to see people as they are and to love them as they are and to pray for opportunities. And people cotton on really quickly if they know they're just a project. Yeah. But I think if they know that we we really do love and care for them and are interested in them, that makes a difference. And we've tried to do that with our, our neighbours and they do come to some things at, at church with us, but they also know that it doesn't matter if they say no, we'd, we'd still like to hang out with them, we'd still like to go out for a curry with them, we're still happy to help them because we actually really, really like them mm-hmm. and are interested in them. And, and so I... I think we just follow Jesus' example there and, and ask the Spirit to work if he will. But if we if we don't put ourselves in the place of loving those people, who will? Hmm. That's a great comment. And, you know, I want to dive into some of you. You talk about seven ways to welcome like Jesus. Uh, I want to get your thought on this before we jump in there, and that's this. When you offer your home or somebody welcome inviting them in and you're married, now it's a married situation because you have a husband or a wife that may or may think differently about this. Can you comment on that? Like, you know, sometimes I'm complaining when Ann's inviting somebody over. Maybe it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. Maybe one's an extrovert, one's an introvert. How does it work as a as a couple? And and you might have kids, so it's really a family thing. It isn't just me being hospitable; it's us. Is there tension there? Do you have to get on the same page? What's it, what can that look like? You're listening to Dave and Ann Wilson with Carolyn Lacey on Family Life Today. We'll hear Carolyn's response in just a minute, but first. As a listener of Family Life Today, we know you believe God does some of his most amazing work in homes just like yours. Whether that's a small group Bible study or laughing on the floor with your kids or sharing a meal with your neighbors, the home can be the launching pad for God's work in this world. And you can help make an impact for more families and spread that vision by financially partnering with Family Life. All this week, as our thanks for your partnership, we want to send you a copy of Carolyn's book. It's called Extraordinary Hospitality for Ordinary People. You can get your copy when you give this week at familylifetoday.com or when you call with your donation at 800-358-6329. That's 800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. All right, now back to David Ann's conversation with Carolyn Lacey and being hospitable as a married couple, especially when you have different personalities. Yeah, well, I think a good thing to do is is pray together. I've been chatting with a friend about this because she is a grade A extrovert and her husband is off the scale introvert. And, and so this is a challenge for them. And I've encouraged them to pray together and, and maybe set some realistic expectations. You know, mm. is it okay if on this night, every other week, we maybe have somebody from small group round and we'll talk about who it's going to be and how it's going to go. But that doesn't mean that the extrovert can't be hospitable the rest of the time, but maybe just in a way that's sensitive to the family, maybe meet somebody for lunch in a work break, um, maybe invite someone out for a coffee, um, perhaps say to your introvert husband, you go home and get the food on after church and I'm just going to go for a walk for half an hour with that person who I saw sitting on their own. So Mm. we can also be creative and think of other ways to show welcome that are perhaps sensitive to the people 
we live with. I mean, similarly, if you live with unbelieving family, you, you want to be sensitive about that. So you might want to be creative and and look for opportunities to show welcome to people outside the home sometimes. Are you and your husband always on the same page in how you're doing this and what it looks like? What's he like? Well, he's a pastor too, and he's just shattered most of the time because life's really full on and he's out a lot at meetings. And so, you know, if you've got one free evening a week, sometimes he'll just think, you know, Caroline, I'm completely depleted of all my energy. It's not going to work. And and we'll just talk about it. Is this the right week? And, And sometimes it isn't. And I can see that. And and sometimes we both say, you know, we're not really up for it, but we need to push on through. And we end up being really encouraged and, and blessed by the person we had round. So we probably both face the same challenges mm-hmm. and just have to spare each other on a little bit. Yeah. Well, pick any one of these or a couple of these seven ways to welcome like Jesus. I mean, we've got generosity, compassion, humility, persistence, awareness, inclusive, and self-sacrifice. Which one comes to your mind first? Let's talk about the awareness thing. The chapter's called Tailor-Made Hospitality in the book, and it's about how we can be aware. Because when Jesus was here, it's so interesting that he treated people differently according to their different needs. Mm. And he he welcomed people differently and he initiated contact with people differently. So sometimes he invited himself to someone's home, like Zacchaeus. Other times he initiated conversation in the street or by a well or in the synagogue or in, in the temple. And he just had this wonderful way of seeing people as individuals and tailor-making his welcome to meet their needs. And and I think we can be very formulaic. Like we were saying before, the house has got to be clean. The food has got to be good. The conversation's got to be entertaining. This is what hospitality's got to look like. And if I can tick these steps off the checklist, then I've done a good job. But actually to be aware, to look at people as Jesus did, as individuals and think, what what would it look like for that person to experience welcome? What would make them feel seen and heard and valued? And and that might be sometimes a really nice meal. That could be a really great treat for someone. It might just be sitting for two hours with a cup of tea and letting them pour out their heart and, and share their stories. It might be offering to take them places, take them to the doctors, take them to whatever appointments they've got. And and I just think starting to think outside the box and think more, what does this person need rather than what do I want to do for them hmm. or what do I think hospitality for them should look like is the best thing to come for lunch on a Sunday. Perhaps not for them, but I had a friend who went through a difficult time a number of years ago and I just used to go to meet her at her place of work for lunch once a week because she just needed somebody to come and remind her that in this particular trial she was going through, God is good and he's wise and he's loving and he's with her. And that's what hospitality looked like, meeting her in in the cafeteria Mm. and sharing a bowl of soup. So I think to be aware of people's needs rather than what we think we want to do for them is something that's good to think about. I remember, uh, you know, as you're sharing that, Taylor made my first year in Detroit, which would have been over 40 years ago, I was playing pickup basketball with some guys I didn't really know because I was new there. And we get done, and this young guy, who's probably 7, 8, 10 years, maybe 15 years younger than me, as we're taking off our shoes, his name was Paul. He says, hey, man, so what's different about you? And I go, what do you mean? He goes, I just noticed something. You're totally different than anybody else I've ever played basketball with. And I'm like, oh, you think my three-point shot's good? What are you talking about? He goes, no, your attitude. And I literally turned to him and I go, I don't know what you saw, but it's probably Jesus in my life. I mean, I went right there with him. And he's like, yeah, that's interesting. We play again the next week and something between us just bonded. Like I liked him. He liked me. We started talking and that's where it hit me. It's like, I want to see if I can have an impact in Paul's life. And I could tell by what he did that the best way to do that would not be, let's go to lunch or let's have a conversation about Jesus. So I said to him, 
So you work for Stanley Door, right? I need a new front door. You want to help me put a front door in my house? Long story short, he ends up in my house with a door. And so as we're putting in this door, we're having conversations. And I'll never forget, after we put the door in, we're sitting on my couch drinking a Coke. And he turns to me and goes, hey, by the way, I just want you to know something. I don't believe any of that stuff you believe. And I go, what's that mean? So we had this conversation, and I find out that he was sort of homeless. His dad left. He lived on the streets in Detroit, never finished high school. But he kept saying, there's something about you and your family. I keep wanting to come back here. So he kept coming back to our house for little house projects. Paul ends up giving his life to Christ, gets married, has kids now. It's one of these amazing stories that as you were sharing, Carolyn, I thought, wow, it all started with a tailor-made invitation that was tailor-made to what would bring him in our life and us in his life. It's so funny, too, how you think like, oh, we're going to bless him and we're going to do all these things. And he ended up being like this incredible gift to us. Yeah. His personality, his gifts, his strengths, the wisdom that he carried as a young man. He was remarkable. And I think that often happens as you think, oh, I'm going to bless them and I'm going to bring them and in and I'm going to maybe share the gospel. And we think we're going to pat ourselves on the back. And yet what happens is we gain so much. Yeah, and I think, as you just said, Carolyn, the whole idea of awareness, what I hear you saying is there's Pauls all around us. There are people that God's bringing into our life and us and others' lives that if we have our eyes open and are aware, we'll be like, oh my goodness, this isn't just a chance encounter with my neighbor or even this stranger. God's trying to give me eyes to see that I am his light in their moment of darkness to be generous, to welcome them just as Jesus has welcomed us. I mean, I know I'm preaching your book, but (laughs) that's really what you're talking about, right? Yeah, it is. And I and I think the same goes even within the church family. And people come to church in Christians come to church in, in different states, don't they, every week? And, you know, let's not assume that everybody needs the same from us. Mm. You know, look around. Who who seems a bit distracted mm. this week? Or who do who do you know that might be caring for an elderly parent or a special needs child or who's gone through a difficult life situation and you know, what will be most helpful to them? What will most communicate God's love to them? And that's something we can all do, but it just takes a moment of thought and prayer and being prompted by the Spirit. But rather than assuming that everybody needs the same thing from us. I love the idea of our listeners, of us taking a moment, and maybe we've even posted on social media, of this week, I'm going to become aware. I'm going to be looking. And so we we begin looking for people that we can bless or we can talk to or that tailor-made situation of asking, what does it seem like they need right now? But to yeah. step out, because it's so easy to get lost in our own world. So many of us are going through pain and worry, anxiety, depression. And there's something about getting our eyes on someone else even when we're hurting ourselves, that it really does miraculous things. And maybe a great way to do it is do it with your family. Yeah. I don't have time to go into the times Anne's taken our boys in the car and picked up people. I mean, you got some crazy stories, but it gave our boys a vision for this is how Jesus wants us to live, aware Mm. that God has put us in somebody's life or put somebody in our life to do more than say hi, but to welcome and invite just as Christ has welcomed and invited us. It's Romans 12, 13. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. You've been listening to Dave and Ann's conversation with Carolyn Lacey on Family Life Today. Are you a parent? Let's get real for a minute, okay? Three years down the road, that preteen of yours won't be a preteen anymore. That's scary. The issues will be harder and they'll be different. So take a weekend with your preteen to make great memories that connect the two of you and talk through some of those difficult topics. In fact, we can help you talk about dating, body changes, peer pressure, things like that. Though totally awkward, they can make or break teenagers and teens to be. You could start talking with Family Life's Passport to Purity. That's now 25% off with the code PASSPORT 
for a limited time at familylifetoday.com. Tomorrow, David Ann Wilson are going to be joined by Kim Anthony as she talks with a former drug lord who found true freedom while he was in prison. It's tomorrow. On behalf of David Ann Wilson, I'm Shelby Abbott. We'll see you back next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a production of Family Life, a crew ministry, helping you pursue the relationships that matter most.